catastrophic. The duration of the shaking goes on for minutes. Widespread. Vancouver, BC gets it, Seattle gets it, Portland gets it, Eugene gets it, Medford gets it, Reading gets it. Everybody gets the same event at the same time. That devastating event known as the Big One. The Cascadia subduction zone lurks off the coast of Oregon and Washington, running more than 600 miles all the way from Cape Mendocino, California, to Vancouver Island in Canada. Ian Maiden, with Oregon's Department of Geology, says subduction zones are actually the end result of the Earth's plates pulling apart somewhere else, generally in the ocean. At the other side of the planet, if you are spreading here, something has to kind of collide on the other side, and that's called a subduction zone. And what happens is that the uh, ocean plate typically will slide underneath the continent and be shoved way down into the bottom body of the Earth, tens of miles, um, where it tends to trigger melting and produces a chain of volcanoes that we call a volcanic arc. Scientists have been able to learn Cascadia's earthquake history for the last 10,000 years. It's had about 40 large earthquakes in that time. 19 of which have been magnitude 9 or larger that involved the entire fault all the way from California to British Columbia. Earthquakes that large are almost unheard of anywhere. The most recent struck Tohoku, Japan in 2011. Combined with the tsunami that followed, it killed about 20,000 people. That's what we face here in the Pacific Northwest. The last Cascadia event was in 1700, about 300 years ago. Maiden says the average time between the big ones is about 500 years, so we may still have some breathing room, but... Earthquakes are not like a bus. They do not arrive on a schedule, and there's just a probability associated with their, the, the next event. The odds are somewhere between 12 and 20 percent in the next 50 years that we'll see one of these magnitude 9 earthquakes. Another way to think about that is that that's an 80 to 88 percent chance that we won't. It's most likely that most of us living here won't experience this earthquake based on those odds. But if we do, it will be absolutely life-changing for everybody. First, on the coast. In the tsunami inundation zone, everything is destroyed and the main priority is to get people out of there before it arrives so they aren't killed. Next, the coastal area that is outside the inundation zone. There won't be any operating power or water or sewer systems. Roads will be out, um, and the problem there is going to be managing long-term refugee populations. And there will be aftershocks, big ones. Magnitude 9 earthquakes have magnitude 8 aftershocks. By the time it reaches the Willamette Valley, Maiden says the Big One's effects will be less staggering. People are still at risk, buildings may collapse, but the biggest problem the Willamette Valley will face will be a long recovery process, dealing with breaks in the water lines, breaks in the power system, damaged bridges that will make it harder to cross the river. It's not going to look like the end of the world, but it's going to be extremely inconvenient for a long time, for months or perhaps years. East of the Cascades, in places like Bend, the physical damage will be light, but they will carry the social impact. This is going to affect the entire Pacific Northwest all in one afternoon, and it's going to change our economy and our culture and our society profoundly. Beneath our feet, the ground is moving very slowly, but here in the Pacific Northwest, according to geologists, we are actually rotating in a clockwise movement because of the ongoing exercise of the Earth's crust, what is known as tectonic plates. You've probably heard of the North American plate, the Pacific plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, the Gordo plate, or the San Andreas Fault Blanco Fracture Zone in the infamous Cascadia Subduction Zone. I'm Cord 6 News Meteorologist Joseph Dames, and this is a crash course on plate boundaries and earthquakes. Let's start with a map of those plates that impact us here in the Pacific Northwest. Here we have the Pacific Northwest Fault and Plates Explainer. We'll start with the North American Plate. That's our main plate of action here, and it's driving to the west, naturally. And then there it's going to start to collide with the Juan de Fuca Plate. Of course, because it's moving to the northeast. And it's at this intersection where the Cascadia Subduction Zone forms. And what is occurring is that Juan de Fuca Plate is actually driving underneath the North American plate. Let me take you to this cross section right here. So this is the cross section of the Earth to help show how this interaction is working. What exactly is going on? Let me explain. Again, the Juan de Fuca plate is driving under the North American plate, which creates stress building and building into the Earth's crust. 
The energy that is produced, it doesn't just pass by. It's actually lifting up the whole coastline and eventually through time it will give. Now this setup will activate three types of earthquakes. A mega thrust earthquake, which think the big one. The other two types are deep and shallow variety earthquakes. All three of course are dangerous. Now a deep or shallow earthquake can cause strong earthquakes like those in the past. For example, in Washington, 2001, the Nisqually 6.8 magnitude earthquake. Now it's the whiplash though of the mega thrust that will be the 9.0 powder keg earthquake caused by the Cascadia subduction zone. So now knowing that, what's the difference between our earthquakes and those to the south in California? Well, they have a whole different fault. It's the San Andreas fault they could see slicing through the state of California, which goes underneath cities. Again, that's the San Andreas Fault, which is a transform fault different from the subduction zone, and it actually spans 750 miles. It kind of moves like an airport conveyor belt where they go side to side where you can see here in this example. So again, here's a map of all the faults and plates that affect us here in the Pacific Northwest. Now these are the two major scenarios that cause damage up and down the west coast from the Cascadia subduction zone, those shallow and deep variety earthquakes up in Washington and parts of Oregon. And then there's the San Andreas Fault down to the south. So there's a lot going on. I met with geologists Ian Maiden and Scott Burns here in Portland who have been studying and doing research about these faults and plates for their entire careers. Take a second and join me as we discuss the strength of these faults and how Oregon and Washington has now joined California in earthquake country. The subduction zone earthquake again is 30 times bigger than the largest earthquake that you can get on the San Andreas Fault and affects this entire three states or, and, and, and one uh, province area simultaneously. California, nothing like that that has that sort of scope. Um, the, the rate of large earthquakes here is probably a little bit less than on the San Andreas Fault, but um, it is in many respects more hazardous as a result because we have no experience of it and we haven't prepared for it. We never thought that Oregon was earthquake country. Everybody knows about California, but uh, we, we, uh, since the seismograph was invented back in 1880, we have had very few large earthquakes like over 5.0. And we just thought we just are aseismic, just not prone to earthquakes. Washington had a large one in 1949. Uh, and so we've known that Washington was more prone to uh, earthquakes than, than Oregon. A typical afternoon on the Oregon coast. Fishermen bringing in the day's catch. <laughs> Families playing in the sand. They aren't worrying about the threat of the big one. But when it happens, the Oregon coast will see catastrophic levels of devastation. Tom Horning is a geologist and city councilor in Seaside. How often, Tom, do you think about the threat of earthquakes and tsunamis here? Every day for my personal lifestyle issues, and I think about it for the community lifestyle issues. More than 30,000 Oregonians like Tom live in the tsunami inundation zone. And during the tourist season, some 60,000 extra people could be at the Oregon coast. While it's impossible to predict exact numbers, experts say Seaside is likely to have the most casualties, partly because it's so flat. When the wave hits, it could be anywhere from 25 to 55 feet high. Some estimates even have it reaching 100 feet. You do not want to be in that water. People don't just drown. They are frequently crushed and ground up by lumber and all this material that gets picked up by the water and transported along with it. Water doing 20 miles an hour that hits you with a 10,000 pound log is gonna do some serious damage. People will have about 20 minutes from the time the earth starts shaking before that tsunami hits. We drove one of the evacuation routes marked with painted symbols on the street. It's about a mile and a half from 12th Avenue near the beach to high ground. But when faced with a real tsunami, you won't want to drive. It'll be the mother of all traffic jams. You can't make it. And many coastal bridges, including those holding up Highway 101, are expected to fail. We need to have evacuation routes that are reliable and do not collapse during the earthquake. And since Seaside has two major rivers running parallel to the beach north-south, if those bridges were to fall down during the earthquakes, people would be trapped and there wouldn't be enough time to avoid the tsunami. 
Tom says the city has four bridges that could withstand a severe earthquake, but there are seven more waiting. We've been trying to fix one particular bridge for 10 years. We've been waiting a long time. And that's just for one bridge. We've got seven. Our bridges are very vulnerable. Oregon's Department of Transportation is very frank about the state's infrastructure. It's not very prepared at all. If we had the earthquake today, you would see virtually every route in western Oregon would be compromised. By their numbers, 138 bridges need to be completely replaced. Close to 50 of those are on the coast. More than 500 bridges need to be rehabilitated or retrofitted. And there are more than a thousand landslide and rockfall dangers to be dealt with. It's been relatively recent that we've discovered this Cascadia earthquake. So many of our bridges predate that discovery. Back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, much of the interstate was built during that time, and the bridges are from that era. And it wasn't until the 80s into the 90s before we began to appreciate the magnitude of this earthquake. And so we've been playing catch up since then to prepare our bridges. Deputy Director Paul Mather says the agency has a five-phase plan. But coastal highways and bridges don't start showing up until phase two. And Seaside doesn't hit until phase four. Instead, interstates and highways leading to the Redmond Airport take priority. Redmond Airport was chosen because of its location away from the event and the damage that's going to happen on the coast in a place that's large enough to handle our response efforts. The phases build out from there. But based on the available funding, ODOT says it will be decades before they are complete. In case we don't have 50 years or longer before the big one hits, Tom has been urging the Seaside City Council to increase the room tax to pay for new bridges. This is the best tax you could ever come up with. It should, it, people should be demanding it. So far, no dice. If the council doesn't change its mind, Tom says a ballot initiative may be in order. If the citizens don't want to do it, that's fine. They made the ultimate decision. They can suffer the ultimate consequences. It's like a terrible crime, you know. I, I, I think that we have enough momentum at the uh, Tsunami Advisory Group to make this thing happen. In the meantime, he says he is optimistic about preparedness among coastal communities. There's a pretty deep understanding on the part of the public that there is an earthquake and tsunami hazard at the coast. From up top, looking down. In nature, what we do is we look for straight lines. If rivers are straight or if the edge of a mountain is straight uh, or a mountain range is sticking up uh, that is straight, a good working hypothesis is that there's a fault at the base of that. The signs of these faults are right in front of our eyes. If you know where to spot them, one fault is actually right in Portland's backyard. The classic one that we have here is the West Hills Fault or the Portland Hills Fault. When you fly into Portland, it's just, it's a straight line between downtown Portland and Scappoose and Rainier. Uh, and why is it that? Well, it's a fault and everything has been uplifting uh, along that. These crustal faults are separate from what we would know as the big one. Oregon and Washington, we have got lots of faults that are uh, in, in North American plate. All of these forces that we have got are causing all of our rocks to be put under pressure. And you have stress, 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 and then bang, they break. This is a map of all the faults across Oregon. There's hundreds of them. You can see all the lines scattered across the state. Now, geologists say it's the length of that fault that determines the strength of the earthquake. And the Portland Hills Fault could produce up to a 6.7 magnitude earthquake. It's going to be a shallower earthquake. It's going to be less magnitude, uh, but it's shallower, and so therefore it will affect the people. It's still knock us to the ground, and it will cause some liquefaction. So the question is, are these faults active? Will we experience another earthquake? Many of the faults in Oregon, we don't know if they're active or not. It, it, to be called active, it has to have gone off in the last 10,000 years. And many of them, we think, are active because everything is moving in the Pacific Northwest. In Portland, Oregon, with your Coin6 Digital Special, I'm meteorologist Joseph Dames. In the immediate aftermath of a disaster, most people will only have one thing on their mind. Where is my family? If there's been a large earthquake, there's a good chance many roads and bridges will be impassable for days, if not longer, and cell phone towers may not work. So it is critical to have a plan. Communicate as much as you can before communication goes out. That's the key. 
Steve Eberlein and Lydia Ledgerwood Eberlein have a long history of disaster relief. They saw firsthand the effects of a 9.1 magnitude earthquake and the devastating tsunami it triggered while living in Sri Lanka in 2004. Now, they've made preparedness their number one priority through their business Tipping Point Resilience. In terms of reunification, we talk about the most likely scenario, which at this right now would be three kids at school, Steve in an office, me at home or out and about. Um, and then we take a look at that, and for our situation, our three kids are across the river from us. So that creates a big decision point, which is what happens if neither one of us are on the same side of the river as the kids and the earthquake hits. Reach out to family and friends. Can they pick up your kids if you can't get to them? Can another parent take them in? Is a neighbor able to care for your pets if disaster strikes when you're away from home? Who can help elderly or disabled community members? Designate a common contact who is out of the area that would be affected by a Cascadia earthquake. It's also crucial to designate not one, but three locations to meet up with your family. The assumption is you're gonna all try to come back home, but in some cases your home is not gonna be safe after an earthquake. Steve and Lydia designated a local park as their secondary reunification site. It's a place that our kids know well. We can put up a tent there. It's within walking distance. Um, but your local park might have problems too. If gas mains break and suddenly, you know, your park is not safe either, having a third reunification spot as well would be advisable. Having enough water, food, and other supplies is also key to surviving in case it takes a while for help to get to you. Flashlight. Experts recommend you stash supplies at work, in your car, and of course at home. The home kit obviously should be the most robust of your kits. That's where you're going to keep at least 14 gallons of water per person in your home. You're gonna keep 42 meals per person in your home. Be aware of food allergies when picking your food and get some single ingredient nutrition sources if needed. A lot of the stuff that comes in the emergency pack, it's just this cube of allergen basically. So um, this has put my mind at ease. Also consider items like flashlights, a battery powered or hand crank radio so you can get information after the disaster, first aid kits, medications, tools and gloves, and sanitation and personal hygiene items. You also need to consider the messier side of things. Not a lot, a lot of trash bags. Your toilet. Lydia is a big advocate of the two bucket system. That means one bucket for liquids and one for solids. You'll also want a carbon source. It could be dried leaves, it could be sawdust, it could be wood chips. While it may seem like you should keep your kit hidden away and untouched, don't feel like you can't dip into your supplies. We use it. We go to soccer practice, we forget water, we use that water, and we're good to go. I think it's also important for people to realize that the stuff we're sort of squirreling away uh, for a disaster is also can be useful to you in real time as long as you replace it. Steve and Lydia know it can seem overwhelming. They say to build up your kit over time. And remember, Part of the reason we really emphasize the family reunification plan is for one, that's the center of what you care about. That's your central value, making sure your family is safe. So start with that because one, it's the most important thing to you. And for two, it is accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. Everyone can afford to have a conversation. Yep. I am working on symphony number no. five. As Brian Johansson stands in the kitchen of a Southeast Portland home. The sound's in my head and then it goes down to C sharp there is a much different sound happening in his basement. His 1906 house is being seismically retrofitted by Michael Weber's company, Northwest Seismic. This is a retrofit anchor bolt. So it goes into the side of the sill plate and the side of the foundation. There are various side plates we can use. And this installs into the block and then to the sill plate. That gets our, our, gets our loads from the house into the sill plate. So house to sill plate, sill plate to foundation. This concrete here, got a really nice sound to it. Uh, I don't think we have any trouble with this, but a lot of these foundations that were poured before 1930, they're pretty much held in place through memory. It's, it's kitty litter with memory. And in an earthquake, they have a, there's a high probability those, those will just implode into the basement. So why waste the money retrofitting? I tell those people to put that money into their retirement account. He says many people choose to pour a new foundation. That can be expensive, about $80,000. But he says most retrofits are about 4,000. 
can be done in a day and include anchoring the water heater, especially if it's a gas heater. Is there any way for a homeowner to do this themselves or DIY it? Yeah, they need to come to one of our workshops. They're free, it's two hours. Actually, they're more like three hours these days. As for earthquake insurance, he has a skeptical view. Unless you've got a lot of equity in your house, whatever you might collect from that insurance policy, it's probably gonna go to the mortgage company. There's layers, like there's the strings doing something and the bass is doing something. I've got the harp doing something. And for Brian Johansson, the sounds under his feet equal nectar. peace of mind. Your home, it's just safer and uh, these are things you have to do as a homeowner, I guess. Being prepared. Dan Tilkin, Coin6 News.